Hello. In this video, we put all of our knowledge of truth tables and logical statements to use as we t talk about equivalent statements. Let's get started. So to begin, let's examine two statements. Suppose we have statement A and statement B, and these are compound statements. If we use the notation double arrow, and it's a wide double arrow like we see in the slide here, we say that that says statement A is equivalent to statement B because they have the same truth values, meaning when one statement is true, the other statement is true, and when one statement is false, the other statement is also false. So how would we check with a truth table that this is possible? Well, we would check to see if they have identical columns. If they do, we would say that these two statements are called equivalent. So for example, suppose I have a compound statement, parentheses, P or R, close parentheses, arrow, so that's an if-then statement, remember, negation of Q. And let's suppose that I claim that that statement is equivalent, so that's that big double arrow, to the following statement, parentheses, not P, and not R, close parentheses, arrow, so another if-then statement, Q. So how would one test that these two compound statements are truly equivalent? So are they really equivalent? Well, one could begin by creating a truth table like we see on our slide pre-done for you, right? But what I encourage you to do is to pause the video and maybe cover it up with a blank sheet of paper and see if you could recreate that truth table from your previous experience with truth tables, right? See if you can get the same exact columns. So what we did here, what they did for us, is they noticed that there would be eight rows because there were three basic statements, P, Q, and R. They did their traditional half true, half false for the P column, and then two by twos, trues and falses for the Q column, followed by one by one, true and false for the R column. Then we built our first statement that we're checking to see if it's equivalent, so the left statement we'll call it, the statement P or R, then not Q. So if P or R happens, then not Q should follow. So we first began then with a P or R column. Remember for the disjunction, it would be true only if there is at least one truth. So comparing the P and the R column, whenever there was at least one truth, we wrote true like we did here, right? So the first five were true, then the sixth was false, then a truth and then a false. Then we built the rest of that statement by finding the not Q column. So we took the opposite of the Q column. So instead of true, true, false, false, et cetera, et cetera, we started with false, false, true, true, et cetera, et cetera. From there then, we would build our entire statement the parentheses of P or R, close parentheses, arrow, not Q. In that case, remember with the if then conditional from our previous videos, that a conditional statement was false or a lie if the antecedent, so the uh, condition is met, is true, but the expectation called the consequent was false. So if there was a T and then an F, so comparing this one as your antecedent and this column as your consequent, going in this direction from left to right, right? Whenever you had T and then F, so T and then F, that was a falsehood, right? And so they built out that entire column that way. So check your work and see if you can do it the same way. So once they have that entire column for that statement, what they did is they built another column, eventually they worked their way up to it, for the statement on the right. So this statement here, in parentheses, not P and not R, close parentheses, implies Q. So they built a not P column by taking the opposite of P's column. They built a not R column by taking the opposite of the R column. They put them together with the AND statement that was required. Remember for an AND statement to be true, what had to be true? They both had to be true, that's right. So anytime those two columns were not both true, which happens in the first case, they're not both true, and in the second case, they're not both true. It happens quite a bit, actually. It's not until the sixth case down here where they're both true, which is why we have a true statement there. And again, it happens in the eighth column, eighth row, rather. And so finally, we can put all that together to create the second statement on the right, parentheses, not P and not R, implies Q. So where is our Q column? Our Q column was way at the beginning, right here, right? So we said to write this statement out, another if then, we're comparing this column here, the parentheses, not P and not R, with the Q column here, and we have a conditional, so the order matters, right? So this is your first, your antecedent, and this is your second. If the first is true, but the second is false, then that's a falsehood, and let's see if that happens when we have our first being true. Here's our first truth, 
and there's a truth, so that's okay. But here's a truth and here's a falsehood, so that's where we have our falsehood, okay. So we notice here that we now have our final columns that we can compare. So in the end here, you compare them and you say, are they equivalent? Are they equivalent? If they are equivalent, then they have to be identical at the final, at the final column. And notice they're definitely not even close. So we would say that these two statements are not equivalent. And the way we would write that is typically putting a line through the equivalent arrow, double arrow, okay? So that is how we check if two statements are equivalent using a truth table. It can be tedious depending on the original statements. Well, let's head to our next slide and see if we can put this to use. Again, pause the video and try this one on your, on your own. It says construct a truth table to determine if the compound statements below are equivalent. And notice again, it's using that double big arrow for the equivalency. So are these two equivalent? So to begin, you can pause the video and see how you did. All right, let's see how it, how it worked out for you. I'm gonna use blue as my truth color, okay? So for my P, Q, and R column, because we have three simple statements here, I'm gonna do my half truths for my P, four truths followed by four falsehoods, and then for Q it's two truths, and then two falses, two truths, two falses, and for R it's one by one, right? True, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. And I'll use my red for my falsehoods just to keep myself visually organized. Maybe you don't need to do that, but I like to keep myself on track here. Okay, feel free to skip ahead if you've already done this. So our standard setup here. Okay, once we've done that, we continue building our truth table. So I would begin, remember where? In parentheses, right? So in the parentheses here, I don't have any negations to write out, so I'm just gonna write Q and R. And what had to be true for an and statement to be true? That's right, they both had to be true. So let's see if that ever happens. Are Q and R ever both true at the same time? In the first case they are, and in this, this is the fifth case? Yeah, in the fifth case they are as well. Any other times where they're both true? I don't see them, so let's make the rest falsehoods then. So T, F, 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 and then T, F, F, F. So there's my Q and R column. Then I continue building this truth table by incorporating the beginning of it without the parentheses, right? P or that parentheses. So P or parentheses Q and R. So now I would be combining the P column, so that's this column here, together with the Q and R column that we just talked about. So looking at these two together. Now we're combining them with a disjunction, with an or. Remember what had to be true for an or statement to be true? That's right, at least one of them had to be true. So look carefully, okay, watch me carefully here. I'm looking with P and the Q and R column. Is at least one of them true in the first row? Yes. How about the second row? Also yes. How about the third row? Yes. Fourth row? Yes. Fifth row? Yeah, look, P, Q and R is, even though P is not. Good. But in the seventh, eighth, and, sorry, sixth, seventh, and eighth rows, those are all falsehoods, aren't they? Because we do not have at least one truth. And again, it's really easy to confuse your columns, so pay close attention when you're doing these. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to maybe highlight, I'll put like a nice yellow um, boundary around it. That's going to be my first column that I'll be checking on, right? I want to check on to see if that's going to be the same as the other, the other major statement, compound statement. So let's build the other one here. So where do we start? Well, if we have a neg negations of individual letters, we'll do those first. So how about the not P column? Taking the opposite of P column, that would mean instead of four truths followed by four falsehoods, we would start with four falsehoods. So F, 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 followed by four truths, T, 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 T. Right? And since we already have a Q and R column, we already have that right here, we don't need to rebuild it, but sometimes you will have to re, you know, build another column if it's a new piece, right? So we're going to now say, I can write the entire statement here, not P arrow, so if P does not occur, then Q and R should follow, right? Q and R should follow. So let's see if we can build that carefully. So we'll be looking at the not P column as our antecedent, so that's like what happens first. And then our second, or our consequent statement, is Q and R, so this would be second. So we're comparing these two here, and the order is important, right? We are going that way, we're going from right to left here. 
So not P, then Q and R. So if the first is true, so if not P is true, and if Q and R is false, then we can say this is a falsehood or a lie. So let's see. Well, we only really care about then when not P is true, right? When the first is true. So that would be these last four here, these last four rows. So when these last four are true, do we ever get a falsehood for Q and R? Yes, we do, right? Here, here, and here, don't we? So the first is true, but the second is false in the last three rows. So those three would be our falsehoods, wouldn't they? Which means our original five rows would all be truths because the condition wasn't even met in the first four cases, and in the fifth case, it was met and the promise was delivered, right? So would these two statements, these compound statements, be equivalent? Let's take a look. Would this statement here be equivalent? The purple and the yellow, are they equivalent? Well, exactly, they are the same, aren't they? They have five truths in the first five rows and then three falsehoods. So yes, they are all the same. You could say they're all true, 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 or you could just say yes. Okay, so for that equivalent spot, they are exactly the same. So we would say, yes, these statements are equivalent. Or at the beginning, we could have just put this double arrow between them, okay? So there was an example of how we used a truth table to show that those two statements were equivalent. In the last slide, we had shown that they were not equivalent. So make sure you know the difference when they are and when they are not. All right, let's head to our next slide. It says, example two, could you construct a truth table to determine if the compound statements below are equivalent? Okay, so these ones are a little bit less tedious. Let's see if you can see the difference. The last one we did was pretty intense. It had a P, a Q, and an R, and now we just have a P and a Q. So why does that make this easier? Because there's only four rows, that's right. So see if you can pause the video and try this one on your own. Okay, since there were only four rows, the first column for P is just true, true, false, false, and the Q column is just true, false, true, false. That's right. Okay. Next up, we're going to build our first statement, which is not terribly difficult. It's just the if-then statement, right? If P, then Q. So the order matters. Again, P is first, Q is second. So if P, then Q. So let's write that here. If P, then Q. So that's our first statement we're going to build. Remember, for an if-then or a conditional statement, it's only false if the first is true, but the second is false. Here, P is the first, and Q is the second. So does that ever happen where the first is true, but the second is false? Yeah, it happens in the second row, doesn't it? So that's our only falsehood for that statement. The other ones are always truths. You can go back to our last video if you need more clarification on that. All right, so we've now built out our first statement. I'll go ahead and highlight that one. So there's our first compound statement that we'll be comparing with our second one. So let's build out our second one now. We want to build out not Q, then not P. So if not Q happens, then not P should follow. So not Q needs a column. Well, who else needs a column? That's right, not P needs a column. And then the final statement, you're right. If not Q, arrow, or then not P. So if not Q, then not P. All right, see if you built these correctly. For the first one, if you're taking the negation of Q, instead of the TF, TF column, we should have, that's right, FT, FT. Nice job. For the not P column, instead of the TTFF, what should we have? That's right, FFTT. Get that FF here. There you go. And finally, to build our if-then statement, if not Q, then not P, we have to pay attention who's first and who's second, right? So the first one here is not Q. That's the antecedent. That's our antecedent, right? Then not P is our second. So we're going in this direction from left to right this time. And it's only false if the first is true, but the second is false. Does that ever happen? Yeah, it happens in the second row, doesn't it? First is true, but the second is false. Notice how important the order is. If you had switched the order, it would have been in the third row, wouldn't it? So there's our only falsehood this time for that statement, and the rest would be truths. Good job. All right, so now as we make our final comparison, are these two statements equivalent? Let's take a look at their final columns. Are they identical? Yep, they're the same for the truth. They're the same for the falsehoods. 
They're the same for the truths and they're the same for the truths. So if they're the same, then they are equivalent. So yes, these two are equivalent. Okay, we've proven that they are equivalent. Now, it just so happens that this particular statement, let me write it to the side here, you'll definitely want to write this in your notes, P then Q, so that's a very important statement. That's called our conditional, right? If P then Q, very popular. So there's our conditional statement, P then Q. We've now proven with the truth table that that will always mean the same thing. That's what we mean by equivalent. We're translating it into a different way, but it means the same thing. It uses different symbols, but it means the same thing. It's like when you're going from one language to another. It means the same thing, even though it sounds different. In this case, even though it looks different. Is the same as not Q, then not P. So these two statements mean the same thing. We have a name for this. It is called the contrapositive. Contra usually means against, and positive usually means positive, right? Don't have a really good definition for that, the opposite of negative, right? So the contra positive, okay? So it's saying something in a in more negative way, but it means the same thing as the original. Why is that? So this contra positive here means the same as the original conditional statement. So for example, the P then Q statement could be something like, if you do your homework, then you pass the test. Okay, what would the contrapositive be? Switch and negate. So sometimes I say flip and negate, right? So flip and negate. You're flipping the antecedent and the consequent and you're negating them. You're doing both of those things. That's very important. So when you flip and negate, instead of saying the original conditional statement, if you do your homework, then you pass the test, now it would be, if you did not pass the test, then you must not have done your homework, right? And those mean the same thing. Now if I had just flipped them, that's going to be something else we'll talk about in the next slide called the inverse. Oh, sorry, the converse. Or if I had just negated them, that would be called the inverse. Those don't mean the same thing as the original conditional. But if I flip and negate, that's a contrapositive, and that is going to be equivalent to the original. Okay, so let's talk about that in our next slide. So here in the box at the top left corner, we introduce four definitions for you, okay? The first one we've already talked about here is the contrapositive at the bottom of that box. It says, if not Q, then not P. And we already mentioned that that is the same, or that is equivalent to the original conditional statement. And you can see that in the truth table that we have on the top right box here. So this is a nice truth table. If you take your time with your slides, print it out, maybe write it out yourself. The conditional, we've already done that in our last slide, gave us that column. The contrapositive, like we did in our last slide, gave us that column so that these two were in fact equivalent, right? They, they meant the same thing. So the contrapositive is equivalent to the original. But notice here what we mean by something called the converse. So what is the converse? Well, the converse just flips, right? It flips the antecedent and the consequent. So now P is where Q was and Q is where P was, right? The condition and the expectation have been switched, okay? So notice that those are not the same as the original conditional statement. Let's take a look. So Q then P, that's this column here called the converse, right? Notice that if you look carefully at the truth table, they're not exactly identical, are they? There are some cases where they're the same, but there are some cases where they are not the same, right? In the second row, for example, and in the third row, notice how they're not the same there, okay? So we have to be really careful to remember that just switching the antecedent and the consequent does not mean the same thing. For example, if the original conditional statement was, if you do your homework, then you pass the test, switching those two without negating it would have been, if you pass your test, then you must have done your homework. And that's not exactly what the professor promised, right? So you have to be really careful. Those don't exactly mean the same thing. But what is interesting is that the inverse is also the same as the converse. Let's take a look. What I mean by the same, I mean equivalent. What do I mean? Well, the inverse does not require that you flip the antecedent or the consequent. Instead, notice it just requires that you negate the original P and the original Q, where they were. So instead of if P then Q, you have if not P happens, then not Q should follow. Okay, so that would be like saying in this example, remember the original was if you do your homework, then you pass your test. This would be if you don't do your homework, then you don't pass the test. Doesn't mean the same thing, even if you think it does, we can prove it. Take a look at your truth table here for the inverse. Again, it's not exactly the same as the original conditional statement. It fails at the same two rows as the converse. But notice what is interesting 
is it is equivalent in every case to the converse. So the converse and the inverse are equivalent to one another. If you're wondering why that is, maybe you haven't started to wonder yet, you're just a little overwhelmed with all the definitions, it's okay. But the reason is, they're actually contrapositives of each other, right? Notice that if you take the converse, which is if Q then P, and you flip it and negate it, what do you end up with? You end up with the inverse, right? And so that is why those two are actually equivalent to one another, but they don't mean the same thing as the original statement. Okay, so that would be one that we'll have to definitely pay attention to in our notes, okay? Another important equivalency that we need to pay attention to on our slide here is when we're dealing with what we call um, a conditional statement that we want to write as a special disjunction. Disjunction. Remember, the disjunction is an or statement. So we're saying, you know what? You can take an if-then statement and you can make it an or statement. Really? How would that make any sense? Well, let's take a look, for example, at the statement again. If you do your homework, I'm just going to abbreviate here. If you do your homework, then you pass your test, right? Okay. So if that's your original if-then statement, if P, then Q, we could rewrite that, I'm claiming, as the following. We could say either you didn't do your homework, you did not do homework, or else, put my or there, or else you should have passed the test. Notice that says the same thing as if you do your homework, then you pass the test. If you, you did not do your homework or else you would have passed the test. It's more of like a past tense thing in, the, in this case. And that's what we see in this truth table here. We see not P, which is what I wrote here, you did not do your homework, right, that's not P. Or, or else, you could also say, you would have passed or you do pass or you should pass, right, the test. They should mean the same thing. And here we see in the truth table that they do in fact give you identical final column. So those are in fact equivalent. So that would be another one to write down in your notes. It was that you can take an if then statement, so that's a conditional, right? And you can write it as a disjunction if you put the first antecedent as a negative, so not P, or, but you keep the consequent the way it was, Q. So that's what I did here. I said you, you did not do the condition, right? You did not meet the condition, otherwise you would have had the expectation. That kind of makes more sense, right? And again, I'll summarize these at the end, but make sure you're keeping good notes as we move along. Okay, the next one I want to point out to you, the last one on this slide, this very long slide, is something called the negation of a conditional. The negation of a conditional means, so you have your original conditional here, right? If you do your homework, then you pass the test. How would you take the opposite of that or say the opposite of that, okay? So it's not true that if you did your homework, then you pass the test. So how would you show that that's not true? Well, how about you did your homework, so let me write it here, you did do your homework, but you did not pass the test. Now, wouldn't that be saying the opposite of the, of the original statement? The statement said, it, it, it was a promise, right? That if you did your homework, you would pass the test. But look, you did your homework and you did not pass the test. And and but mean the same thing. And that's what we're saying right here. P and not Q, okay? You did your homework, that's P, and is the same as but, you did not pass your test, that's not Q, right? So look at that column with me, when we build it out, it's FTFF, and we're saying that should be equivalent to not the original conditional, if P then Q, but the negation of the conditional, so it's not true. So how would I say, in another way, that's what equivalent statements mean, in another way, how would I say that it's not true that if you, did your homework, you'd pass the test. And the way you would say it, according to this truth table proof, by saying you did your homework, but you didn't pass, okay? Because notice how those are identical. So this would be another one to put in your notes. It was um, P and not Q is another way of saying that you did not have a true conditional. So the negation of P then Q in parentheses there. Those mean the same thing. Okay, so those would be two to, more to add to your list as your ever-growing list here, which we'll summarize at the end. So the negation of a conditional is a special conjunction here. That's the blank if you're looking for it. 
Conjunction just means and, P, not P and Q, or in this case, P and not Q, rather. All right, so take a look at this slide, maybe take a little break, and then come back as we enter into some examples. Here's our first example from that busy, busy slide. It says, write the contrapositive, the converse, the inverse, so all three of those, for the original conditional statement. Here it is. Every Friday afternoon, traffic is heavy. Every Friday afternoon, traffic is heavy. Well, if you live where I live, that is very true. Hopefully, it's not for you. Now, when we see the word every, do we remember what we use instead? So every and all? That's right. We make it into an if then. So when we see the word every, we rewrite it as if something happens, then something follows, right? So let's rewrite that into an if-then statement. So if it is Friday afternoon, then what happens? Then traffic is heavy. OK, so there is my original statement, OK? I've rewritten it into an if then. Now notice here that they were asking me for a contrapositive, a converse, and an inverse. Notice those are always if then statements. So if you are given a statement which does not appear to be an if then, you need to do the work and change it into one that means the same thing. So the every just became an if then. All right, so how do we find the contrapositive? You remember, you can look back at your notes if you don't know yet. That's right, we flip and negate. When I have in-class students, they often make this symbol when they're actually taking their test. It's quite amusing. Right. So they flip and negate. That's our contrapositive. So what we write here, so flipping and negating. So if we have P, if P then Q, now it would be if not Q then not P. So in English, if they give it to me in English, they want it back in English. So here it is. If traffic, so that's the flip, right? There's the Q moving up to the front. But now I have to negate it as well. So I'll make a little note here. Is not heavy, then it is not Friday, how about that? Or it must not be Friday. I'll just write it is not Friday. We're not testing your grammar here, okay. Now remember, those two statements are equivalent, right? A conditional is equivalent to its contrapositive. You might wanna to go to bed saying that over and over again. A conditional is equivalent to its contrapositive. So those two statements, I'm gonna write our big double arrow here, those are equivalent to one another. But no, remember what is not equivalent to the original? The converse or the inverse, you're right. They're equivalent to each other though. So what did the converse do? It just flipped the antecedent and the consequence without negating, right? So simple flip. So to simply flip the original statement, this would be if traffic is heavy, then it is Friday. All right. So that is the converse. Remember, that does not mean the same as the original. OK, so it's not the same as the original. What is it the same as, or what, what is it equivalent to? It's equivalent to the inverse, right? So the converse and the inverse should be equivalent to one another. So how do we get the inverse again? We don't flip, we simply negate where they are. Negate where they are. So if it is Friday becomes if it is not Friday. That's right. If it is not Friday, then traffic is not heavy. And hopefully you can see here that's, that, that is very clearly not the original statement, right? The original statement only told us that if it was Friday, we know about the traffic, Friday afternoon rather. And again, I probably should have said afternoon in all of these. I realize that now to be more consistent, right? We're talking about Friday afternoon, not Friday morning, okay. So in each of these, we have to compare. Does it really say the same thing as the original? Well, in the first case, it, it just promised that if it was Friday afternoon, we can tell you one thing, that traffic is heavy, right? But notice it didn't tell you anything about Thursday or Wednesday or Sunday or Saturday. So by saying if it is not Friday afternoon, then traffic is not heavy, that's a little bit of an over, um, someone has read into that statement too much, right? That was not exactly what the person said, okay? So this statement here is equivalent, the original, to its contrapositive, which required both flipping and negating. Not only flipping, that's the converse. Not only negating, that's the inverse. All right, so practice stuff like this with these conditional statements until you feel really comfortable because we're gonna be using them again and again, not only in this video, but in future ones as well. All right, let's try our next slide, here we go. Example four. Can you write the negation of the given conditional statement it says, every Friday afternoon, traffic is heavy. Okay, so same statement again. 
So notice it says it's a conditional statement. It doesn't look like it right now, so you would have to change the every to an if then. So once again, we'll write what we did last time. If it is Friday afternoon, then traffic is heavy. Okay, so there is our original statement. We're asking you now to negate this. So remember we did a negation earlier. You can look back in a couple slides ago. What we did there was we said, okay, what would it mean for this not to be true? It would mean that it's Friday afternoon, but traffic is light or it's not heavy, right? So we would say, in this case, we have if P then Q, right? And you can go back to your notes. We said that in order to take that and what we call negate it, that's what we call the negation of a conditional. So the negation of not P or Q was equivalent to a special conjunction, right, an and statement, where the first condition is met, so that's P, but the expectation, or Q, is not delivered, okay? So we said those two are equivalent to one another. So in English, how do I, ex how do I explain that? Instead of saying if it is Friday afternoon, the traffic is heavy, the negation would be it is Friday afternoon. Notice I don't need an if then for an and statement, so I don't need to write if. It is Friday afternoon, and you can write the word and, or if you prefer, you can write the word but. Traffic is not heavy. So this would be saying the opposite, right? Or in other words, it's saying that that statement wasn't true, right? So when we're talking about a negation, it's negating something. It's saying, nope, that did not happen, or no, that is not the case. So how do you say that is not the case? Another way, by saying the condition was met, so it is Friday afternoon, but the expectation did not happen, but traffic was not heavy, okay? So we need to be able to go back and forth between an, a conditional and its negation. So that's another one to check your notes, make sure it's there. All right, let's head to our next example or slide here. Example five. Can you rewrite the given conditional statement as an equivalent disjunction? Interesting, equivalent disjunction. So it's not asking you to negate it this time. It just wants it in another way, okay? So let's see. It's the same statement as before, so we're going to make that a conditional statement by once again saying, if it is Friday afternoon, then traffic is heavy. Okay, so we have our original conditional statement and we would like to rewrite it another way as a special disjunction. So sometimes they tell you how they want you to write it, other times you have to do that yourself. Figure out another way that means the same thing. So you gotta be really sharp with these. Okay, so remember we talked about in our notes that if we had an if then statement, if P then Q, that was equivalent to a couple of different things. We talked about rewriting it as a contrapositive earlier, so flipping and negating, we can do that for a conditional. But we also said you could write this as an or statement, a special disjunction, where the original condition is negated, so not P happens or else Q must follow, okay? So you can look back at our truth table, we, we have that proven for us in a few slides, a few slides ago, okay? So let's see how we would interpret this in English, okay? So negation of P would be, it is not Friday afternoon. And then the disjunction means or, and in English usually we'll write the word else afterwards, but that's optional, right? Or else, or, or traffic, I'm gonna say would be, you could say is, traffic would be heavy usually how we would say it in English, right? It's not Friday afternoon or else traffic would be heavy, okay? So not P or else Q must have happened because the original promise said if P happens, Q follows. So in order for us to say the same thing with an or statement, we would have to say that can either the condition didn't happen or else the expectation should have happened. All right, so that was another example of how we need to become very comfortable taking conditional statements and writing them as the equivalent disjunctions or contrapositives, or in the previous example, having, how we actually, actually had to negate it, okay, using our special conjunction. All right, so let's head over to our next set of equivalent statements. Very long lesson, take a break if you need to. So for the last type of equivalent statement we're gonna talk about, 
we're going to use a very fancy name. I think you've heard it before from a previous chapter. De Morgan's Laws, named after the mathematician De Morgan, who discovered them. And De Morgan's Laws are special because what they're doing is they're distributing, kind of like you did in algebra, they're distributing a negation across a conjunction or a disjunction. So we see that here. We have a conjunction, P and Q in parentheses, and we would like to negate it. So it's saying take the opposite of P and Q. Another way of saying this in English, it is not true that P and Q both happened. For example, if P is a statement that I like iced tea and Q is a statement that I like Coke, this is saying it is not true that I like iced tea and Coke, right? So what is another way of saying that in English? Well, De Morgan's Law says, and we'll show you the truth table to prove it as well, it says that you can distribute, if you will, the negation as long as, this is really important, as long as you flip the connective. So it's distribute and flip. You might want to write that in, in, in English on your paper. Distribute and flip. So that's what we notice here. We've distributed, so it becomes not P, it becomes not Q. But look what happens to the arrow here, the connective. Instead of an and, it's now flipped into an or. Okay. So this is saying that another way of saying that same statement, that it is not true that I like sweet tea and Coke, or iced tea and Coke, this would be, I do not like sweet tea, or I do not like Coke, right? So that is saying the same thing. And we can see that proven to us if we don't, if it doesn't feel right, right? Take a look at the truth table with me here. So they built us a truth table, and you can hopefully build this yourself as well, where they had noticed that there were just two simple statements, P and Q, so thus there are four rows. They built it with half true, half false for P, true false, true false for Q. They built the P and Q column first, so it's inside parentheses here, by saying that to be true for an and, they both had to be true, and they found that only happens in the first case. Then they negated it by taking the opposite, so then it became false followed by four, three truths, and that's what they had for this column, for the negation of the conjunction P and Q. So what they did then is they wanted to prove that that was equivalent to distributing and flipping, right? Flipping the connective, which is what we call De Morgan's Law here. So to show that, to prove that for this column, they carefully built the column out. They found the not P column by taking the opposite of the P. They found the not Q column by taking the opposite of the Q. And they put them together with or, which meant they had to be true only if at least one of them is true. And that happened in these cases, the last three rows. Notice that they are identical, okay? If they were not identical, then these statements were not equivalent. But because they are identical, we use the double arrow here, yes, these two statements are equivalent. So this is an example of De Morgan's Law where we distribute the negation across a conjunction, an and, as long as we flip each of the originals and flip the connective, distribute and flip, okay? Notice they do that as well for the disjunction, so it is not true that P or Q happens, that should mean the same thing as not P and not Q. And again, you could prove that the same way we did with the last one using a truth table. Try it on your own. Okay, so let's see in English if we can apply De Morgan's Law without having to do a whole truth table. Can we do this with the shortcut? Let's see. So it says, for example, we could use De Morgan's Laws to rewrite this statement equivalently. So let's read what this says. It is not true that Joe ate both a hot dog and a burger. Okay, so what do we usually encourage? That's right, rewriting it in symbols. So it is not true, would be my tilde here, my negation symbol, that, and notice we're not just saying one thing, we're saying two things connected, so a compound statement is coming, which implies parentheses, right? So that what happens? That Joe ate both a hot dog, so eating a hot dog could be like P, and a burger could be like Q. So P and the symbol in between them, the connective is and, right? So this is the original statement, negation of P and Q in parentheses. How do I write that as an equivalent statement using De Morgan's Law? What do we do? Flip the connective and make sure we distribute, okay? Or distribute and flip, we said. So this should be not P or not Q. So that's symbolically, but if you wrote that on a test, typically you wouldn't quite get full points because it was given to you in English, so you need to give it to them back in English. So let's see if we can write this in English, okay? How would this look? Not P would be, Joe did not eat a hot dog. Joe, I'll use the abbreviation didn't, right? 
didn't eat a hot dog or not Q, he didn't eat a burger. And sometimes what they'll do in English, right, is they'll put the word either at the beginning when you have an or statement. So feel free if that makes more sense to you in English. Either Joe did not eat a hot dog or he didn't eat a hot, or he didn't eat hamburger, right, or a burger. Okay, that's how we can say the same thing as it's not true that he ate both of them. Okay, so that would be the answer there. And let's see if we can apply the same reasoning to our next slide. Example six, can you use De Morgan's laws to write the negation of the given statement? Okay, see what kind of statement you have here. I'd encourage you to pause it and try it yourself. I think you can do it. It will rain or snow tomorrow. Well, if they live where I live, this can't be true, okay? Maybe you could have snow tomorrow. Okay, it will rain or snow tomorrow. Well, that is an or statement. So the original is if P, not if P, but just P itself. There's no if then. P itself or, that's a disjunction, snowing tomorrow would be the letter. That's right, Q. So there is the original statement. Now, what do they want us to do? Do they want us just to rewrite it equivalently somehow? No. They want us to write the negation of it. So when someone asks you for the negation, they're asking you to do something to the original statement. So we have to negate that statement. Well, they also gave me a clue. They said De Morgan's Law. But in reality, you shouldn't need the clue. As soon as you see a negation of an and or a negation of an or, immediately you should think De Morgan, which means distribute and flip. So this negation of an or is becoming an and by negating each of the originals. Not P, not Q. So this is what it looks like symbolically, right? Now keep in mind, sometimes your original statement would have negations already in them, right? It could have said in the original, it will not rain tomorrow or it will snow tomorrow, in which case taking the opposite of a negative would become positive. So keep that in mind. So in English, how would I write this? The negation of this original statement? It would be, it will not rain. And, I'll just be very emphatic there, it will not snow tomorrow. Okay, so notice we negated. We also flipped the connective. That is how we negate an or statement, by making it an and statement that has flipped or negated the originals. Okay, to summarize here, I want to show you on our last slide a list of all of our um, most, most popular equivalent forms that we should have memorized. So I've tried to combine them here in one place for you, but you really should spend time writing this down yourself to really, really learn it, to memorize these, because they come up so often. Let's look at the first one. How do we take a contrapositive of a conditional? We flipped and negated. So that's what we see here. So we flipped them and we negated them. So we did both. So flip and negate. If only one of those is done, then you're talking about either the converse or the inverse, does not mean the same as the original. How did we negate a conditional? To negate a conditional, so you had the original conditional, and then you negated it, okay? How do you negate a conditional? In other words, how do you say that that conditional statement was not true? If the first thing was true, but the second thing was false. So P, and how do you say that both happened? That's an and, P and not Q. So that's a special conjunction there. The negation as a conditional it will always be a conjunction. How did we find another way of writing an if-then statement or a conditional statement using the or, okay? Remember this is or and this is and. That's what we mean by con um, conjunction and disjunction. Okay, so how do, we, how do we do that? Well, we said for the original here, if P then Q, that means the same thing as the first thing didn't happen, otherwise, the promise should have happened, right? So not P or Q. So those two mean the same thing. De Morgan's Law. We just practiced that a second ago. De Morgan's Law is taking the negation of a conjunction, which is what we have here, or of a disjunction. And in both cases, we do the same thing. We distribute the negation and we flip the connective. So that's what happened here. This and became an or. And similarly, for the last one, when you're taking the negation of a disjunction, an or statement, what do we do? We distribute, so not P, and the or becomes and, not Q. All right, so make sure that your notes are very thorough and complete and that you practice identifying what this is. How can I say it in another way called an equivalent statement? 
And how can I prove that two statements are equivalent using my truth tables? Happy practicing. Remember, math is not a spectator sport. I'll see you next time.